Hello, first, everybody. I would like to introduce my friend Vision. Vision owns Mind Valley. Who doesn't know Mind Valley? Um, Vision started Mind Valley from Malaysia, and his company makes over a hundred million in revenue without having any investors in his company. And we're going to find out how he does that. Thaddeus owns, I'm going to say it right, <laughs> Limit Breakers. He owns a company that manages celebrities' wealth, and we all know that celebrities need something like that. But throughout his community, in his company, he throws gigs and shows, and he sells out over 10,000 to 5,000, 20,000 tickets. And it's crazy, and we're going to find out how he does this as well. So. I'm going to get right into it, but I need short answers so I can ask you as much questions as I can. Absolutely, Sarah. Done. So without being cute and appropriate and nice, I, wanna, I want people to know, how do you start a business that's disruptive, that changes the world, that really impacts and can make this much in revenue without any investment? So in my case, we apply a rule called the 50-50 rule of goal setting. So remember this, every goal you set for your business, for a team, at Mind Valley, the rule is 50% of your goals or 50% of your OKRs must have a 50% chance of failure. That means you are never supposed to attain 100% of your goals. If you have four goals, two of them must be so ridiculously high that they have a 50% chance of failing. This means if you are good at math, you're only going to attain 70 to 80% of your goals. So when you set goals like this, you give people the freedom to think really big. If you expect your people or yourself to hit all your goals, you will naturally, naturally like cap yourself. But by insisting that you must fail on one of your four goals, this allows you to be disruptive. But this allows the team around you to even feel comfortable about coming up with crazy ideas even right. if they fail. Exactly. Okay, Thaddeus. Um, most people think in terms of how and what, what to build, how to do it. I think we start off with why and who, meaning the power of one. Instead of thinking masses, think in just one person. How can you build a relationship with one person, know this person better, better than the person know itself, and think in terms of a needs. What is this person needing today and tomorrow and focusing on that? Once I do this, this person going to go out and find someone who is like them, and then you have a look-alike audience who you know better than then they know themselves, and focus on serving these people. So the why, why they do what they do, why they need what they need, and the who, who do you focus on? How, how did you come up with your business idea to create Mind Valley? So in my case, I think the most important thing for an entrepreneur is don't build a business for money. I have tried that. I've tried to build a business for money. I was responsible for, um, I, while I was, so I started Mind Valley because I loved meditation and I built a little e-commerce website selling meditation CDs. And then after a while I thought, this is so stupid, right? Like this is never going to make money. So. I got $2 million from Intel Capital Ventures to start a business that would make money. It was a Groupon clone for Southeast Asia. Problem is, six months going into that, even with $2 million in the bank account, I hated my life. I hated myself. I couldn't wake out of bed each morning, and I had to quit. I had to give back my shares to the other founders and say, guys, if I continue doing this, I'm just going to kill myself from misery. Now, that little meditation website, which I thought was never going to make money, but I was really into it. That ended up growing and growing and growing and growing and growing. Uh, it went on. So we, we just made the HSBC PricewaterhouseCoopers list of next uh, unicorns in Malaysia. And we are uh, most definitely going to be worth about a billion dollars. And we have never taken a drop of venture capital. Just pure passion. Never build a business for money. I believe great ideas are out there. And a great idea is something that is meant to be created. And I believe, in a spiritual sense, that these ideas will come and whisper in your ear. Elizabeth Gilbert, in her book, Big Magic, said, the universe will come and whisper in your ear what is meant to be created, and your job is to listen. And if you don't seize that opportunity, the universe doesn't give a damn. It'll go and whisper into someone else's ear. So you've got to listen to those whispers. Things which are meant to be created will be created, but never do it for the money. Do it for that, that heartache, that passion, that whisper, that nudging that disturbs you and makes you feel that your life is incomplete until you build this thing. I think 
passion attracts money. It does. And when, when I sit with some people and they make a lot of money and I talk to them about their business, I don't see any passion. But when I talk to both of you, I smell your passion you know, out of your business. What is your answer to the same question? Um, I do not believe passion uh, attracts money. I believe that passion can be the driver, but it's actually the structure. It's actually do a structure in a way that this other person can... This is how I see money. Money is an excuse that you can give me a higher value than I brought you. So I, my job is to bring you a value that you could not build for yourself. And that's why you excuse, give me an excuse by giving me money. So I can take the money and get value for myself. So everything we're building, we don't build it for the money. We, I bring it, I build a business to bring it such value that you actually want to apologize. But isn't that your passion, to bring such value to the community? And no, because sometimes I do something for you and I don't like it, but I know you need it. I do not like sometimes sitting in a meeting. Well, I do not. Uh, no. but, that, but that's purpose. Yeah. No, yeah, no, no, exactly. No, I, I was going to say that that's yeah. a way to reconcile both of this. The Japanese concept of ikigai, right? Mm -hmm. Ikigai says, do what A, you, you love, that's passion. Yes. But B, it has to make money. And C, you are uniquely gifted at it. Yeah. When you combine all three, yeah. that's when you have a recipe. Don't just follow your passion. Your passion may be stupid, right? It has to be able to make money, and it must be something you can be best in the world at. So to add to that, so I don't follow my passion. I follow other people's passion and build a structure for them to live it. But that's a passion, to follow other people's passion. Yes. That's Maybe, it. yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I know I don't believe in micromanaging. I believe in leadership. Oh, yeah. And um, I know both of you do. Now, fun fact about Thaddeus is his whole company is made out of his family. So, <laughs> so the family produces people, and he, he gets the people involved in the business, and they're all hired, and they're all part of the company. What is the, uh, the cultural organization you have, like the culture in your organization? Since it's all family, like... It's Every not, time I meet someone that works for you, like, that's my cousin, that's my niece, that's my niece. <laughs> yeah, that's my second oldest nephew He's over right there. there. <laughs> and um, number one is cheap workers. I'm just like... <laughs> <laughs> no, I think, I think um, <laughs> all my employees, all my, all my employees, they, by me having my nephews involved in the company, um, my employees feel like they are part of the family. Yeah. And as a family, we have one virtue and that is serving our customers like their family so whatever you put out there would you put it out there for your family if not don't put it out there as a product got it and bringing my family in um allows me to teach them without actually having to talk to them directly by my, my nephew sitting here because for him it's like oh it's his business by him sitting here i can actually show him how to treat people that that it's not where we come from. I'm born and raised in Germany, and some people see me as a black per just as a black person. I'm like, no, I'm business. <laughs> I'm not black. I am business, and I show my family that by being business, I can bring value to the world, and and they follow along. That's why I bring everyone in the family in to actually teach certain values. So it's not about business. It's actually about teaching values. That's why I have. How, how do you fire a family member? Do you kick oh, them out I of the WhatsApp other, group? I let other fam, I let other family members. So once every, first of all, they cannot just come into the company. They actually have to prove themselves to get into the company, and they do not follow me. They follow values, and when you break those values, you fire yourself. Okay. Right. So it's basically just following values, following principles, and all of us following those rules. So I don't fi fire, it's more you found out it's not your values, that's why you leave the company, which happened already, and everybody respects that. And then they ki get kicked out of the WhatsApp group. No, I help you to find something for you that fits better your values, which I is not within our structure. I love it. I'm, I'm Indian, which means I have 200 cousins, <laughs> and now I'm thinking, who can I hire? <laughs> we have Arab, Indian, Af we all have a lot right. of cousins. Exactly. <laughs> so how, what is your, or the culture in your organization? In my case? Yeah. A culture? So we, so 
what happened to me was really fucked. Sorry, fuck, really messed up. Um, I, I was in uh, the United States um, and I built my company in New York and this was after September 11 and um, I got added to the Muslim watch list which was formed in 2003 and what this means because I was born in a Muslim country in Malaysia and what this means is that I couldn't board certain planes I couldn't use airports I had to go for a two hour interview before going on a plane two hour interview coming off a plane every four weeks I had to report to the government for fingerprinting it was horrible. Um, and this lasted five years until Obama, President Obama ruled it unconstitutional. So I had to leave America because of that, even though I, I loved America. I had to go back to Malaysia, but I missed New York. And in Malaysia, there was nothing. Back in 2003, you didn't, we, there was no startup ecosystem, so I decided to create my own. So I came up with a campaign convincing Europeans and Americans to move to Malaysia to work for Mind Valley, uh, and I... I I positioned us for the beaches, for the close proximity to Bali. And before I knew it, I had the number one place to work in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. And um, fast forward 10 years later, we have an office in Malaysia, which is an Inc. magazine, top 10 most beautiful offices. And we employed people from 60 different nationalities in that office. Wow. So even though New York kicked me out, I created my version of New York in Malaysia. And but the thing is, you you can do this. All of you are from a developing country, most likely like me. Don't let that mentality make you think you don't deserve it, right? Uh, there are certain competitive advantages to being in Alguna, to being in Cairo, to being in, in other parts of the world, to being in Amman, Jordan, that if you can learn to position, you can attract talent from all around the world. Um, I agree totally with that. Yeah. Amazing. Um, I don't, I used to believe in working hard. I stopped doing that six years ago. Now I work smart, I don't work hard. My working hours are reduced. My investor, Wayne, who is a friend of both of you, he taught you something. He told you, right. you asked him, how does a man become a billionaire? Because right. he's a billionaire. What did he tell you? So Wayne, who's a mentor to me and Sarah, he is a billionaire. He was one of the World Economic Forum um, um, top 100 people in tech in 2000. Um, he was once giving me a view of his beautiful apartment in Dubai, one of the tallest buildings in Dubai, overlooking the Palm Jumeirah. And he says, Vision, you know how to be a billionaire? And I go, what? And he goes, work 21 hours a week. So I asked him, what do you mean, work 21 hours a week? He says, look, work seven hours on a Tuesday, seven hours on a Wednesday, seven hours on a Thursday. Keep Monday and Friday free. And I go, how does that make sense? And he goes, because if you do that, firstly, you are teaching yourself to operate hyper-efficiently. Secondly, you're keeping Monday and Friday free for creativity, for opportunity. If a friend says, hey, Wayne, come to London and check out this idea. You can fly out Thursday evening, spend the weekend in London, be back Monday evening for your work on Tuesday. So it took me six months to figure out how I could bring my working hours down to 21 hours. And now I've done that, which is why I'm here. Yeah, I actually applied the same thing, but like a couple of years ago. And now I can fly whenever I want. I'm all over the world whenever I want. And I, I'm more efficient because I work smart. I don't work hard. So how many hours do you work now? So on my core business, Mind Valley, which you, you got to keep in mind, is a massive company, 400 employees, over 100 million in revenue. I don't have to work on it if I don't want to because I hire the best people. Uh, my people win awards. One of my people is in the uh, UK uh, top 40 under 40. Two of the Time Magazine inventions of 2022 were created by my people, wow. right? So we bring in this amazing people. So I work only when I want to work. But of course, being an entrepreneur, when I have free time, what I'm doing is I'm conceiving new ideas. Mm -hmm. So right now, my goal is to learn a new language every year and start a new company every year. Amazing. And, but all of it is under the Mind Valley brand. Thaddeus. Work hard or work smart? So I love to work hard. I, I love to work hard. But the same concept. I love to be very effective. Um, I'm an athlete and as an athlete, just working hard going to make you run out, run out of energy. So me, myself, and a company, I might work three hours a week. But we're hyper-efficient and hyper-profitable. But how? Um, another billionaire friend of mine, um, taught me this, I said, look, number one, you need a superstar when it comes to marketing. You need a superstar when it comes to fulfillment, and you need a superstar when it comes to legality, legality and finance. So what I do is I hire entrepreneurs who would never work for anyone, and I make sure they work in my company. So that's basically how I go about things. I look for those guys 
who could build it themselves, who was amazing in, in the marketing space. Okay. And then I partner with him, and he becomes part of the family. That's why I call it limit breakers. We breaking limits with the people who are already breaking limits. Yes. Okay. How, I, you know, entrepreneurs go through a lot of stress. Yeah. And I, you know, don't give me the creme brulee vanilla ice cream answer, okay? I need the truth. What do you advise entrepreneurs to do when they're stressed, when they're feeling down, when, when they're anxious? Because my advice is I, I believe in meditation and travel. I, I take a break, I travel. So what kind of activities or anything you would advise entrepreneurs to do so they can regenerate or re become creative and go back into that element? Number one, God is the greatest. So whatever you encounter, that's what I believe, there's nothing bigger than God. That's what I believe. Yeah. Mm. Number two, see everything as a game. So by me seeing everything as a game, I know there are slip holes and someone is good at this game. So by being actually here, you connect with people, you build a network and build a, build a network before you need it. And now you have a lot of people who have advice when we're actually factual, they have experience. So stay connected, have Mondays and Fridays off to be with people who actually can bring you results, who can give you answers for problems you already have. So don't wait till you get down, but bring, serve other entrepreneurs the whole time so when you need advice, they're quick to answer. So don't wait till you're down, stay on the level up. Yeah. Stay there, yeah, stay connected. So there are three things that you wanna do and stress will be permanently banished from your life. What I mean is permanently banished, okay? The first thing is supplementation. Stress is a function of brain chemistry. There are two supplements you wanna take. Every single morning you should be taking 5-HTP. 5-HTP is basically uh, serotonin in pill form. It's very affordable, but it changes the neurochemistry of your brain so you have higher stress tolerance. Trust me, entrepreneurs, this will change your life. For moments when you do feel stress, you wanna take L-theanine. L-theanine, again, is a supplement. It's like taking 20 cups of green tea without the caffeine. It calms you down. L-theanine, if you need to calm down, 5-HTP every single day. That's number one. Number two, hypnotherapy is very effective in rewiring your brain's conditioning to stress. The number one hypnotherapy for this is Paul McKenna's um, hypnotic trance. It is free on the Mind Valley app. Download the Mind Valley app, click on meditation, search for hypnotic trance McKenna, Paul McKenna. Listen to it in 22, it's 22 minutes. You listen to it seven days in a row, you will permanently, permanently, irreversibly rewire your brain's conditioning to stress. Stress is a belief system construct that you can shift and eradicate. The third thing, a daily meditation practice, the most effective of it is the six-phase meditation, which I designed based on, on neuroscience. It is the subject of my latest book. Six-phase meditation, again, is free on the Mind Valley app. I make it all free because I see entrepreneurs burn out. If you are truly thriving as an entrepreneur, it is not about the size of your business or the money, it is this. Every year you work on your business, you get younger, healthier, and more effective. If you can pull that off, now you are thriving as an entrepreneur. If you're putting on weight, if your hair's getting gray, if you're losing your health, I'm sorry, I don't care how fast your business is growing, you are failing yourself. Sure. Your health has to come first. And stress is the biggest killer of your health. How much? Questions? Guys, if you have any questions, please put your hands up and until they go up to them, just okay. really fast. Yeah. If you, if you could write an autobiography about your life, what would you call the book? Just give me a fast An autobiography? Yeah. For me, Bending Reality. Bending Reality. Autobiography. Give me your mic. Creating Reality. Create your... Oh my God. <laughs> me? Change your reality. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Where's the question? Yeah, here, right here. Hi, Zaro. Uh, my name is Shahira, and my company is called Dirty Cookie. Ooh. And um, I have a question for Vision. Vision, I've been a student of Mind Valley for over three years, mm -hmm. and every time I see you, I want to ask you, and I forget. So I'm going to ask you right here. Um, I love what you've done, and you've changed my life like forever, and I'm very grateful for that. Thank you. And. Um, I want to know, are you going to do anything for children? I know you do Mind Valley University in Estonia for right. kids, but like, are you going to have something on an app for Absolutely, children? yes. We are, looking to, we are looking and scouting for companies which are developing new ways of um, training kids and developing kids. We're looking for acquisitions. Um, 
uh, acquisition targets that we can roll up into the greater Mind Valley Empire. Next question. Uh, hello, I, mean, I really respect you very much. I'm a very big fan. I've seen you before, especially on ads on YouTube. Hold on, who are you talking to? <laughs> uh, of, of course, the guy in the middle. Not us? Sorry. Him? I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, sorry. Hey, but you the, get all the, the attention away. That guy looks cool, I have to be honest. I love his suit. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> also, thank you for giving me the third time asking a question. I really appreciate you, Omar. You're the best. You're the best. I really want to ask, what were the benefits you had from working in Malaysia? Yeah, basically. The benefits from working in Malaysia? The, adva that, the advantages, as you said, every region has its own competitive advantages. Yes. So, so, so in Malaysia, basically low cost, and then Air Asia. Air Asia is the world's number one budget airline. If you live in Kuala Lumpur, you can fly anywhere, Thailand, Bali, it's very, very effective. So we use that in our marketing ads, on, literally on Craigslist in 2005, to get foreign people to come and join our company, so we didn't have to limit ourselves to just the talent pool in Kuala Lumpur, which was non-existent. Because my country has had huge brain drain. 1% of the population was leaving every year. So we had to suck, we had to brain drain Europe and bring those people into Malaysia. Yeah, thank you. I love them. You were marketing people to take the worst airlines? We, we and were it worked? No, we were, we were marketing people in Europe to say, you know, the winters are horrible. Come live in Malaysia, work for Mind Valley, and you can afford to spend weekends on beaches. On the worst airlines. And they did it. Yeah, it's just one of the best airlines in the All world. Right. Hello, over here. Yeah. Hi, my name is Laman. I have a podcast called Cut the Crap, and I'm a very big believer in this whole work smart, not hard. And I've been trying to apply this for a while, but I noticed as humans, we have this coding where you feel like if, if you don't wear yourself out in a day, you have this guilt like, oh, I should have done this. Why didn't I do this? And you kind of mindlessly keep going. So can you give advice how to reverse this coding to be okay with chill, enjoy, Go be creative, it. so on? Um, number one, I ask for the purpose. Number two, I ask for the outcome. Not the way I feel, because a lot of people who are, who are sometimes dragged and feel burned out, they're not burned out because they re really worked hard. They're burned out because they cannot work hard. So don't mistake those two. So when you go with the purpose, what's the purpose? Why are you doing what you're doing? What's the purpose? If you do a podcast, what's the purpose? So you ask, who is listening? Instead of, let me put content out for who is the content and why. Remember? Why? Number two, if I know who, if I know why, who's already serving them? Can I serve in a better way? Can I serve in a more efficient way? Can I w serve in an other way? So now you work smart. And Working hard is very important, but work hard at working smart. Ask for the purpose first, ask for the outcome, and then work hard. And you'll see you have better, a greater uh, capacity to actually fulfill your, fulfill your dreams or whatever you're trying to get. Can I tell you what I did? So we are programmed through education, culture, the way we're raised, that if we're not addicted to being busy, being busy, even if we're not doing anything. If I'm not busy being busy, then I feel like I'm useless. The, the, the step for growth and creativity and for you to prosper as a human being, A, unlearn everything you've been taught from day one, who you are, who you should be, how you should act, how you should react, and teach yourself all these new things. The mind, like Vishen would tell you the same thing, the mind is like tof tofu. Whatever you marinated in, it becomes. So if you keep telling yourself that that's not the way to operate, I need to change my reality and discover who I am instead of who I was told to be, then you learn how to operate. It took, us, it took him six months. It took me two years. It took Thaddeus a long time to adjust to these things. It's not impossible, it's possible, but it, the first step is unlearning. That's the key. Can I, we got right yeah. here. Last thing to that, last thing, right? Um, we at, right here. Um, I heard, I heard the definition, you know, we live by definition. Someone gave me a definition and said, a business is a profitable commercial enterprise that works without me. So I need to build a business that actually works without me because it's serving the community, it's serving the client. So when you want to feel dragged and tired, do it by actually serving people. So what we're doing around the world, we have a lot of people who have no money, who are really struggling, and I'm really working hard on helping those people where I make no money because my business is making money. So don't fall apart by, by building the business, fall apart by actually helping people out there. So, yeah. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Aya Sharif, um, founder of Flow Digital. 
So my question's mainly for you, Vishen. Um, I find that I struggle, I totally believe in hiring the best talent, but as a startup, as someone who doesn't have funding, you know, how do you find and hire and attract the best talent with not a big financial package? You know? So if you, if you read my book, The Buddha and the Badass, I teach a technique in that book called the Manifesto Technique. Um, and the Manifesto Technique is basically this. When I was first starting Mind Valley in Malaysia, and I didn't have access to the right talent, and I was operating from the back room of my father's warehouse in the ghetto part of town, I wrote a manifesto on how I wanted to create office culture, how I wanted to create work culture. And I published this manifesto online and people started sharing it. And from that one manifesto, I got my first hire, who was actually an American who moved from Atlanta to Kuala Lumpur, then my second hire, a Singaporean who moved from Singapore to Kuala Lumpur. And that manifesto was what attracted talent. You will still find it. If you Google Mind Valley Manifesto, you'll find it online. Now, the manifesto is basically your value system, the value system that is unique to you. The value system, so for example, one of the things I put in my manifesto is that we operate not as a team, but as a family. Like, I want to build a company where we take vacations together because we love our colleagues that much. Now, this may seem weird because VCs will probably tell you, don't love your colleagues that much. Like, you can't run run a company like that. But they are weirdos like you. And all of you are weird in some way. That's why you're an entrepreneur. And they are weirdos who share your weirdness. By declaring your weirdness and writing a manifesto, you will attract those weirdos. So the manifesto technique is a really powerful thing that entrepreneurs can do to attract the right weirdos that match their weirdness into the company. And plus, like incentivize them. In all my tech companies, I have an equity pool for all my employees. They own the company with us. So make them feel like they're part of what you're doing and they're not part of where you want to go. They're part of you know, a vision, something bigger than that. What about you, Thaddeus? Remember the passion part? Is it your passion? Or do you build something for other people's passion? So in, what the company we build is number one, for the customers, for the client, and then number two, who owns the company? It's actually people working at my company. They own it. So I'm looking for people. With my, the company is the structure for my employees' passion. So I just compete with everyone else that actually the structure we have is way better for your passion. And it's, I built all of this so you run it. You know, And you'll see there will be a lot of weirdos who will not look for comfort. They're actually looking to fulfill the dream through your structure. One more question. Oh, I'll save the best to last. I want to cut the crap. How do I become family and I'll take a one-way ticket to Malaysia for free? <laughs> no, I'm joking. Um, honestly, so in terms of, we heard today about passion and purpose and value and all those amazing, amazing things. But I was out, uh, you know, outside uh, earlier, I was asked the question by, I don't know, somebody in this room and they talked about failure. Where does failure sit into all this? Because isn't also failure part of this entire, um, I think, interaction or, or on your way to success in the journey? I mean, where does failure come into it and how do you deal with that? How do you overcome that? And how do you use that to take you to drive your purpose and to achieve it? Failure is part of the parcel, isn't it? In our company, you have to fail 25% of the time, right? If, if you're not failing 25% of the time, that's a rough estimate, it means you're setting goals which are too small for yourself and it it actually means that you are not fulfilling your obligation to the company we actually have failure as mandatory but 25 percent of the time this is the 50 50 rule i mentioned earlier 50 percent of your okr should have a 50 percent chance of failure um one part partner says when things go wrong we have a saying he says oh okay he he will go kobe on them what Kobe Bryant did when he lost, what he does is he goes back, go into silent mode, call it killer mode, and actually analyze, right? So failures, in my view, failure is nothing but showing you the limit of your, the capacity you have right now. So it's not the failure which is your problem, it's your capacity. So by actually learning, that's the antidote of failure. So do you fail or did, did you stop growing? If you keep growing, failure is actually helping you to grow. And that's what he does. He wants you to fail to show you you have to grow now. And we as a family, we have to grow. And that got to be our number one value. So that's the take Actually, on it. failure is a missing ingredient. That's it. You find the ingredient and you put it back in. 
But also failure is the best school ever. Like I wouldn't have been who I am. They wouldn't have been yeah. who they are if they haven't failed. But think about it. You fail every single day. When you're going to a location and you miss the Google Maps and you miss the turn, you fail. When you order women, when you order clothes on Shein and you get a piece of plastic instead. Every day we're failing. So why not take a risk and fail in something that would change your life forever? So why are you scared? You take that risk every day. So just take it and it's the best school ever. I've learned so much from failure. I grew as a person from failure. So, so there are two types of cultures in the world. There's guilt-based culture, which is in, in the West. So in the West, if you make a mistake, you beat yourself up. Then there's shame-based culture, which is like India, Malaysia, which is the culture I'm from. Shame-based culture means you're afraid to fail because of how other people perceive you. So you've got to rewire that DNA of shame-based culture. So in our company, we actually make failure um, as this 50-50 rule. And we, we even like one of the, the top quotes I share with my employees is this. It's from Rumi. Rumi said, O ye who cannot take a good rub, how will you ever become a polished gem? And so we must rewire this DNA of shame-based culture, which is actually quite common in the Arab world, the Indian world, and Southeast Asia, so that people have no fear of failure. Yeah, the word aib, failure is aib. We need to like change that mindset and to make it okay. How are you going to kill me? No, we're going to take one more over here. Oh. He's been waiting. Okay, uh, my name is Ahmed Saeed. I've been uh, basically part of uh, different exits, five of them over the last 19 years, including Hotels.com. Um, I changed my strategy this last year to uh, something that aligns a lot more with what you guys are doing. Uh, I have three different startups um, that I initiated this year. And um, I'm looking at basically bringing people who were part of failed startups that I knew um, and having them drive different parts of the business and being, you know, sort of the right hand on, on these. Um, in the beginning of the year, I'm going to start an incubator to, you know, further bring more people like that and create more businesses. But... Here's the, the, the question that I struggle with, because um, this is kind of newer for me. How much equity should I give for the folks that drive, you know, essentially a chief product officer, you know, someone who's really kind of driving as a right hand each one of those startups? And I know that's a difficult question. Do I, I do, I do okay. a 5% like pool equity for everybody that's in the company. So that, that's my method, I don't know about you. Number one, congratulations to all your success, I, I, I admire it. Um, I used to struggle with the problem as well, and then I changed, you know, it's okay to think outside the box. So what we did was everyone coming in our company, you have one goal, goal is drive the business, right? If you drive the business, I'll turn you into something else and that's an investor. So every new business I bring in, the top guys from my company get a share in a different business as long as they kick ass in this business. So I'm building different profit centers. And that's why I'm doing the incubator. So that nice. Yeah, I'm asking that stuff afterwards. So what, what I do is sometimes I have employees who spin off ideas. We invest in the idea and we give them 35%, right? And then these ideas sometimes grow on their own, sometimes we buy them back, but it's been very successful. One of our best ideas um, hit 15 million in revenue in year one. And that employee owns 35% of that idea. So that employee is so happy. But this way we are, we are rather than see people leave to start their own business, they start their business within the company they have 35% equity, we give them the brand, which is why we take 65%, I mentor them. But this way I've turned 15 of my employees into millionaires. Okay, so I'm, I was thinking about 40, 60 is, is very similar. 35, 65, 40, 60 is very similar. I'm gonna go there. So in our company, we have a bunch of millionaires who are employees. But how? They own equity in other businesses they have nothing to do with. Because with the bonuses we pay out, they can have, at the end of the year, they have make a decision. Do you want to have the bonus 
or do you want to be an investor with a huge discount in this new profit center because you're my partner? So in the other business, they become a partner where they don't have to work in. In this business where we work together, they an employee. What kind of numbers do you offer in other businesses? It depends on what business it is. Because I don't go with numbers. I don't go with, I'll give you that much percent. I ask you, what is your goal? What, what do you actually strive for? What are you thriving for? Because it doesn't matter how much percentage I give you, you have a number in your mind to reach uh, outside whatever we're doing. So if you tell me, oh, my goal is to be, be wealthy, I ask you, what does wealthy mean? So I'm actually sitting down with, with people and ask for the financial plan they have in their mind. And I help them and show them how can top that. And based on that, this is the number I give them. And another trick is there is a business that I have, but it's more like, uh, okay, anyways. The, the point is in that business, what I do is I tell them, listen, I want every month from that business this amount of money. Anything you make on top of that is yours. So what happens is they work so hard in, in reaching the goals and the targets and everything, and if they make anything on top, they share it all. So there are so many ways you can incentivize them, but I think your question is simple. Your employees... How do you incentivize them in the company and how much percentage you should give them? Yeah. I think we're spending too much time on one question. Yeah. Guys, we've taken 20 minutes from the next panel. They're going to be 20 minutes short. <laughs> it's, so. I'm on the next panel. <laughs> <laughs> so you might as well stay seated. Ladies and gentlemen, please a warm round of applause to Dea, uh, Sarah El Medani, and Vishen. That was an amazing, amazing discussion. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you.